Welcome to This Week at CBN. And every year on the third Monday in April, Massachusetts celebrates Patriots Day. It comm commemorates the anniversary of the battles of Lexington and Concord, the very first battles in the Revolutionary War. Well, this Patriots Day, shortly before 3 p.m., near the finish line of the Boston Marathon, a different kind of battle was underway. When Boston's marathon began in Hopkinton, runners were on their mark, but they would soon chase a great distance that would feel as deep as it ran long. Well, the day started uh, with a tremendous amount of anticipation and excitement. Uh, you've been training for six months, uh, six days a week. Went out to the site um, and, and, and started running the race. It was a beautiful day. Tom, it was a gorgeous day, and everybody was in great spirits. Down the road, Fenway Park was packed. Catcher Jared Saltalamachia hit a home run, and his Red Sox rallied for a win. We just finished the game, and we were in the clubhouse, got on the bus, and one of the guys just you know, said, hey, there was a bomb at the finish line of the marathon, and then there was another one. Rob Davis had just finished the 26-mile race. He was exhausted. He toweled off and ate then waited to cheer on a friend near the finish line. After hearing the first blast, he was caught 20 feet from the second explosion. The bomb went off right in front of us. People are screaming, and we've gone from a beautiful day in Boston to a war zone instantaneously. And I'm looking just across the street at a guy sitting in his chair with his legs blown off. I looked down at my feet, and the bone of his leg are at my feet. At the same time, there's a girl that's on fire, and she's running towards me, and a police officer grabs her and starts patting down her hair. This girl is shell-shocked, freezing, naked, on Boylston Street. Uh, I start shaking. I'm shaking again. It just, you go back into this, and. You got the smell of the gunpowder, you got blood everywhere, you got people screaming hysterically. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, God, how am I going to get to the point where I can forgive? It's a question that still lingers, challenging many, including some of those who visit the recently restored sidewalk along the Boylston bombing sites. The famed marathon of determination and achievement quickly change, catching all of us flat-footed. It moved to a much different race, one with hurdles, hurdles of fear and forgiveness. I can't at all forgive the two of them or anyone who else was involved. I don't think any motive or any reasoning behind any action that they had planned is ever forgivable. These guys had deliberate intentions to maliciously hurt people. Um, you know, I think everybody can forgive things that happen, but something like that, I personally just, I don't feel there's any room for forgiveness there. Yeah, I want to get angry. Yeah, I want to do some hurtful things, but why, you know? My ultimate goal, my ultimate life is for him, and that's not his way. He wants me to forgive, so I'm going to forgive because I will lay my life down for him. Sanjin Sharma was five miles away from the blast at the bottom of Heartbreak Hill. That's as far as he got. Police stopped him and other runners as ambulances race by. As a pastor and counselor, he's encouraging those who can't see past injustice. And what I share with people is that's a bad place to remain. Resentment and bitterness becomes a place of comfort. It becomes a place where we like to stay. And like many have said, it becomes our own prison. And, and we, we cannot escape and we cannot get beyond. America's most beloved ballpark became a sanctuary of support and strength as the Red Sox helped brand the call for Boston to be strong. Jared's last name, the longest in Major League history, provides him with a reminder. Saltalamachia, it means to jump over a thicket. It's pretty cool because it, it, you know, constantly that's what we're doing is we're jumping over something. We all come to a gap in the road in our, our lives that we need to, you know, get over. For me, that's been a big thing where I don't want to cut my Christianity short. I don't want to cut my relationship with God short and cut corners. And I want to just be at, you know, all in, just be all in for him. And, you know, then I won't ever have to worry about that gap in the road. 
you know, I always have him to help me get over it. And this is where I believe our faith is so essential. If we look at Jesus, there's no one who's been wronged like him in the same way. And yet, he looks down at those who hurt him and he's able to release, he's able to let go. His example helps us and guides us through, through the minefield of emotions that we go through. Rob lives in Hopkinton, not far from the marathon starting line. He's a fixture in the community as a runner and pastor. He's helping others process through their grief and anger while testing the metal of his own faith. God is telling us we have to forgive. It's really for our benefit. As I was able to say, look, I can forgive this person. There's like a weight comes off my shoulders. There's a sense of freedom that I get. We have access to resurrection power in the midst of our daily events. You need to love your enemy. We have to wrestle with what Christ is telling us He wants us to do. It's not an optional thing and a challenge to say, can I really walk this out? Can I, can I do what Jesus did? When He's on the cross, He says something which is so bizarre. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they've, what they've done. Has your Christianity been tested? Without a doubt, 100%. There's so much emotions build up through this whole uh, ordeal. Just think about um, more than just yourself. And stop being selfish for that, that moment and um, you know, what it truly means uh, to be a Christian. And you know, that's, that's what everybody sees. When evil comes at us, our response, the power in our lives comes by being able to repay that evil and, and, and really undo that evil with blessing. With, with, with courage. And that's, and that's where I think we can overcome the fear, and that's where I believe we can overcome bitterness. How do you process releasing forgiveness? You know, going to these hospitals, seeing, you know, I talked to a gentleman who was there with his four-year-old son, and then that's when the second bomb went off, and that's when he realized that, you know, his leg had, you know, been blown off, basically. And the first thing he did was grab his son and just protect him. Um, and then he, he called an officer over and told the officer, just take my son and, and protect him, keep him safe, you know, put him wherever you got to put him. And you know what, I, I look at that and I say, you know, that's what Jesus does to us. You know, he takes us and protects us. Are we people of faith or not? Is God who God says he is? Will God do what God promises to do? and to say, we don't control this universe, we don't control these things, but Jesus does and can. We say it's not our strength, it's God who protects us. If we will allow Him and depend on Him, that's not passive, that's, that's faith. I don't think any of us will ever come to an understanding of what was the real motivation here. And, you know, I, it's beyond belief, why would these two young men somehow think that setting off bombs uh, would ever lead to some kind of renewed righteousness in Boston. It makes no sense. Uh, but if, if you follow the tenets of, of Islam, that, that, that somehow in a Sharia struggle, uh, a jihad struggle, uh, this somehow makes sense for them. But as Christians, what should we do? And what should our response be? Jesus said, this gate is narrow. Uh, this, is, this is a narrow gate that we go through. And it's a gate of forgiveness. And he showed us the way. Here's Jesus. He went about doing good, according to the Bible. And he performed miracles. He did wonderful things. And yet he was taken. He was falsely accused. There were false witnesses that were paraded and, and accused him. He was falsely judged. During all of this, all of his friends, all of his companions, they all abandoned him. One of the disciples who was closest to him denied him three times, claimed no knowledge of him. He was put into a prison. He was delivered over to Roman soldiers who beat him, who mocked him, put a crown of thorns on his head, tore hair out of his beard, slapped him, punched him. And then, at the permission of a Roman governor, they took him out to be scourged, 
And scourging was something that literally could kill you. And then when they were done with all of that, they had yet another trial. And the people, the very people he came to save, cried out, crucify him. And they would prefer to have a thief be delivered to them than, than Jesus. And so again he was taken, and he was nailed to a cross. And as he was dying, he said something incredible. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That is the forgiveness that Jesus is asking from each one of us. We're supposed to be like him, and we're supposed to, to even when people despitely abuse us, we're supposed to forgive. We're supposed to let it go. Now, why would he ask us to do that? Well, he understands what happens when bitterness and anger take root and grow in our hearts. That literally it forms a prison that we can't get out of. And unforgiveness, the saying goes, unforgiveness is like taking poison and expecting the other person to die. For when we harbor that in our hearts, what happens is it leads to incredible things physically for us, but also spiritually and mentally for us. On a mental basis, it'll dominate your thoughts. You can't get past it. Uh, at the very remembrance of it, you'll be back into emotions of, emotions of rage and anger, you know, plotting revenge. On a spiritual basis, it blocks us from communion with the Father. Uh, Jesus said it shuts off our ability uh, to even pray. He says, if you have ought against anyone, don't even bother going to the temple to pray. Um, lay down all of that and go make it right with your brother. But then on a physical level, medical science is now telling us that these things, uh, anger, bitterness, resentment, increase our stress levels, cause various hormones to be released in our brains, and these are triggers for heart disease for arthritis, for all the diseases of inflammation. They all have stress triggers. So Jesus knows what he's talking about. That unless we forgive from our heart, we won't be free. And if Jesus can do it from the cross, he will give us the ability to do that here on earth. Because his great power and his great love is shed abroad in our hearts, it's poured out on us, and so he gives us the ability to do that. But forgiveness is just the beginning, because he asks us to do something even, even bigger. He asks us to love our enemies, those who want to kill us, those who want to wipe us out. Those are the very ones, he says, I want you to love them. I want you to do good things for them. Now that is harder still. But with his love and his ability, we can do that. When you look at the world today, you look at the rise of radical Islam, and you look at our efforts so far uh, to, to try to stop it, and yes, there, there have been plenty of plots that have been foiled, but is the root of it gone? Do we live peacefully? Uh, the answer is no. If we can find a way to love our enemies, to reach out to those who want to plot against us and say, Let, can we do good things for you? Uh, can we provide for you? Can we help you? We can change this, and we can turn this around. And I know what I'm talking about, because in Bandung, Indonesia, a team from Operation Blessing Indonesia went after that, that horrible tsunami. Now, this place in Indonesia, Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world, this place was known as the back door of Mecca. This was the place of radical, radical Islam. But when they were hurt by that tsunami, Christian doctors, relief workers came to them and first, the, the, it was just the basics, food, water, temporary shelter, medical care. But then it turned into something more. It turned into, can we rebuild your homes? Can we help you? 
and in that process displayed Christianity. Initially, the teams were afraid to hold praise and worship and afraid to do prayer meetings. They tried to do them in secret. But the Muslims found out. And when they found out just how devoted those Christians were, just how much they loved Jesus and how much they wanted to pray, how much they wanted to walk out the Christian life, they wanted to know more about that. And they wanted to know more about why Christians love them so much that they would come and help them. Well, it changed things in Bandung, in Indonesia. And it can change things around the world because the Bible says love never fails. That's it for this week at CBN. God bless you.